Well, Eric Gallo was the uh, son of an Italian immigrant who'd come to South Africa in the 1890s and was a civil contractor, and he wanted his son to fo sort of follow in his footsteps, and uh, he sent him to uh, be an engineer at the uh, University of the Witwatersrand, but um, on Eric's own uh, admission, he was an extremely poor student because he spent most of his time gambling and in, and in nightclubs, and uh, so he dropped out, and... Um, he happened to see an advert uh, in, a, in a newspaper uh, wanting a uh, partner uh, in a record distribution business. Uh, this was going to be on the deposit of 2,000 pounds. And uh, so what he said... Date, what date are we talking here? This was now 1926. And um, so he somehow convinced his father to put down the 2,000 pounds, and Eric found himself as the partner in a business which was called Brunswick Gramophone House in Johannesburg. And the basis of this business was that they were importing Brunswick label records from America. This was, Brunswick was a prominent label in America in the 1920s, and they wanted to expand internationally. And so they he also bought the first, built the first um, recording studio on the continent, as far as we can tell. Yes, uh, well, he, the, the first sort of step you know, after strictly being a wholesaler retailer for, for four years, was that he, he sent South African artists to London to record. Now, at the time, there were no permanent recording facilities to be had, actually anywhere, uh, certainly in sub-Saharan Africa. And on the back of the commercial success of those early recordings, which were both Afrikaans artists and, and Africans, um, he um, decided that a permanent recording facility was needed, and so he he built one in 1933. And this was, uh, you know, the f uh, certainly the first recording studio in sub-Saharan Africa, possibly even the per first uh, permanent studio anywhere on the African continent. Let's roll the camera forward, as it were, and look at Gallo during the apartheid years. What was happening to Gallo as a label at that point? First of all. Uh, you know, we're talking now, if we talk about the apartheid era, let's talk about, you know, we're talking about the 1950s, uh, you know, through the, through the early 90s. Uh, you know, Gallo was, was a monolith. First of all, yeah. it, was, it was the perfect example of a vertically integrated company in as much as it controlled the process from the time the artists went into the studios to record to the time that the the, the distribution people were, were, you know, putting the, the records or the, or the cassettes in, in, into the shops. And, um, you know, uh, from a recording standpoint, they had an immensely successful catalog. And not only did they have an immensely successful catalog from the standpoint of local artists, and, I mean, many of them have now become sort of internationally famous. Lady Smith Black Mombazo, Lucky Dubé, Miriam Makeba, these were all people that had started their recording careers, uh, you know, with Gallo at one point or another. And, and um, so they, but they not only were a, a giant in terms of, of you know, local recordings. Uh, when I joined the, the company in the early 90s, Gallo probably had at least 50%, if not more, of the total market for all South African music. But then, in addition to having that, they also had the greatest collection of international licenses of any company anywhere in the world. And this was the era now before, this of course was, you know, long before the era of the present consolidation, when you've got like two or three sort of major mm -hmm. labels. This was at a time when you had maybe a dozen of them or 15. Gallo had every single international license of any consequence, with the only two exceptions were they didn't have Warner, which was an independent company here, and they didn't have EMI, but they had everything else. Mm. And quite frankly, um, a large reason for the fact that they did have this was, was apartheid, because um, there were a lot of international companies that would have liked to have actually set up here and, you know, become, you know, uh, have wholly owned subsidiaries. identifiable subsidiaries, but they were simply scared off by by the politics. Even even yeah. before the even before the cultural boycott really started to kick in. For example, two two of their major deals, which were which were joint ventures, dated back to the mid 1960s. They had a joint venture with 
what was then Columbia CBS Records, later to become Sony. That was the one. And the other one was where they had a JV with what eventually would become a, a Polly Graham. And interestingly enough, of course, the minute the minute the, the government changed here and it was it was uh, no longer seen to be a sin to be doing business in South Africa as an identifiable entity, those JVs pretty quickly fell away. And the reality of running a record label successfully as a business here in South Africa is that you have to have both local and international. Why is that? It just has something to do with the sort of the, the cyclical nature of 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 music and musical trends and you, you know, might have you might have like small record companies that would survive for a while strictly on local catalog but if you're talking about an organization of of any size and continuity you had to have those international licenses to like i say sort of you know roll roll with the cycle mm. when when you know maybe things times were not so good uh, times were not so good or maybe you'd just chosen the wrong local artist to record mm. uh, and if you look at the history of any of the large record companies here they always you know you always needed those international licenses and i suspect that the same thing is is true today and so as they lost all the international licenses that they gathered during the apartheid period, what then happened to Gallo? I'd say two years after, after the new government came in here, Gallo basically looked around and found, hey, you know, they didn't have any international licenses. And furthermore, because during that same period of the 1990s, you'd had all of that consolidation internationally, where all of those once major labels like... Uh, like Motown, for example. Motown was, was a Gallo license, and then it got swallowed up by what is today Universal. Uh, there weren't that many international licenses that were, no, you know, by 1997, there were very few international licenses that weren't tied up. The only two in South Africa that were not tied up, the one was EMI, which is obviously, there was no, no hope there. However, the Warner license was operated by a wholly owned South African company here called Tusk. And so that was the strategy. They said, that is our only option. We have to buy Tusk Records to get an international license, Warner, and that's exactly what they did. So they bought Tusk Records in 1997. And so how do we get from Tusk Records to Warner Gallo? Well, um, in the initial period uh, of that licensing deal uh, where... Gallo bought Tusk, and Tusk had the exclusive license for the Warner, you know, Warner uh, Records here in South Africa. It, it, uh, for the first period, it actually operated as a, um, uh, as a, you know, a, a normal license deal. Then, uh, if you'll recall, there was a change of management at Warner. Warner uh, had been part of that disastrous Warner AOL business, and and and. They were actually forced to sell the record company, and they and they sold the record company. A new management came in, and when when the uh, contract, when the license, when that initial license period expired, because that's the way these licenses always work. They were they, you'd you'd do five a licensing years. deal usually for about five years, yeah. then you'd go back and you'd you know to renew it, then they'd renegotiate. So they came back at at uh, at some point. Uh, this was, it would have been sometime in the mid 2000s, maybe. Mm -hmm. And the new Warner management said, "Look, you know, we're not interested in a, in a, a licensing deal. If you want to continue to have our our uh, you know license, we want a JV." So that was the that was the beginning of this situation where you had it was actually a separate company that was, if I recall correctly, it was 51 percent owned by Warner, 49 by Gallo, and it was called Gallo Warner. And so even though, um, you know, there were many uh, sort of shared facilities, you know, mm. uh, you know, you know the, the same production department, for mm. example, that, was, that would be putting out Warner product in South Africa was, was also working, working on, on putting on the Gala stuff. So there was, you know, there was a, a sort of a, you know, a shared facilitation in certain areas. But in fact, in terms of accounting lines and so forth, they were totally separate entities. So who negotiated that deal with Warner? Well, uh, it was the head, it, at the time, at the time that this happened, Gallo was owned by a holding company that was, was then called Avusa. Mm. 
uh, it had originally started, uh, it was originally called Jonic, and then it was Jonic Communications. And then at some point, the name changed to Avusa. With each of those name changes, there was also a change of the sort of general ownership. Gallo was but one of many, many... Uh, a small ent- part of empire. A, ver- a small part of a, of a very disorganized, uh, you know, would-be media empire. Yeah. Um, uh, very strong in newspapers, owned a theater chain here, uh, uh, the country's biggest, uh, uh, you know, book, uh, retail book chain, etc., yeah. etc. Et anyway, so, unfortunately, the, the chap who was running Avusa at the time was a man named Prakash Desai, and who... I mean, he knew nothing about the record business, but mm-hmm. he took it upon himself to go and negotiate this contract with Warner. And it was a complete stinker. I mean, it was an absolute disaster. It was so disadvantageous to Gallo that it was virtually impossible for, for Gallo to make, you know, to make any money out of it. Gallo Warner continued to have to pay this very, very high uh, royalty rate to the parent company, so I mean, it was it was it was it was a bad deal. It was a bad deal. It was a and bad and deal. The, the consequence of that was that the the company then ended up losing money. They lost money, and and uh, you know, at the same time that that the Warner Gallo side was losing money, uh, you know, the the fortunes of the the local division were also uh, you know declining, and. Um, there was another change of ownership, which happened, uh, uh, you know, October 2012, uh, where a new lot took over the holding company. Yeah, the TML. name was it was yeah the name was changed to Times Media Limited, yeah. TML, and um, right from the start, the new owners made it very very clear that in fact they weren't very interested in in any of Avusa's. Uh, holdings uh, save you know the newspapers and and uh, you know they have a business television channel etc cetera, etc cetera. so I'm sure at that point they just looked at this at this Gallo business and they just saw nothing but but red ink I mean the company in fact had started to lose money I think they re- well they reported their first loss at the end of the financial year of uh, two two double oh seven two double oh eight mm. and at that point uh, you know, you, you, of course, hindsight's an exact science, but you could already mm. see that you know the handwriting was kind of on the wall. Yeah, uh, it was there was nothing but losses. So when this the new owners came in, I mean, it was just you know it Ways was it, it was just you know there was no way that these guys were going to mess around with a a money losing entity that, that that they'd already declared they had no interest in whatsoever. And um, you know the the um, the last five year. Uh, contract with uh, you know with with Warner terminated in um, I believe it was June of this year 2013 uh, and it was, that was at the same time that basically they pulled pulled the plug on the entire operation they've left a, a sort of a skeleton staff yeah. to just look after you know people that want to um, you know continue to uh, you know uh, use you know Gallo songs and so forth yeah, but for things like movies for movies. The, yeah that's right but it's yeah. a, for, the, for the record companies for all intents and purposes been shut down